What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Pacific Drive, a sci-fi roguelite adventure where we are driving a station wagon across a supernatural area known as the Olympic Exclusion Zone, and honestly it's a little bit hard to define in terms of generic genre labels. In spite of that though, to get my usual stuff out of the way first, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. There's a link to my Steam profile that is public down in the description below, and there's also a link to a video down there that explains everything I go over. Moreover, though, in the case of Pacific Drive, it's a pretty straightforward one. As in terms of its game structure, it's a relatively simple game, which should, in theory, lead to a somewhat smaller review. But nonetheless, let's get into it. Now, Pacific Drive released back in February, and I enjoyed my initial experiences with it so much that I knew when I was a little less busy I wanted to circle back and finish it. Which is what we are now doing with this review, of course. No review copy or anything, I did pay for this one back in February, as a little aside as well. Now, as I mentioned, this is a game that's a little difficult to define with typical genre labels. Like, it's definitely a roguelite, but we spend the majority of that time driving our supernatural station wagon through various unstable junctions and avoiding anomalies that harm both our car and potentially ourselves, all while we try to gather resources to hopefully help our character leave this place. Now, to kick things off, let's first talk about the technical state of this one. Now, I personally did not run into any problems at all, and that seems to be the case for the majority of people who play this game, though I will mention I have seen reports of one uncommon bug that happens where it basically becomes impossible to successfully finish a run because you don't get enough of the resource that allows you to open the gateway to officially end the run, but otherwise it seems to be in pretty great shape. But next up, let's talk a little bit about the difficulty of this one. Now, one of the things Pacific Drive does that I really, really like is that it has a very modular difficulty. You can adjust and change all sorts of specific aspects about the difficulty, including how much just basic car maintenance you need to do at the end of every run whether you or the car even take damage if you want to focus more on the story. And while some of these difficulty options will turn off the achievements, the game will tell you before that happens, and you can adjust many of them without that even being a concern. So realistically, if you're having any issues with any specific aspect of this, like even holding down the button to shift from park to drive, for instance, you can adjust that. Now let's talk about our story. What is actually going on here? So we are investigating the Olympic exclusion zone at the very start of the game, which is itself an abandoned research facility, essentially, set on Washington's Olympic Peninsula. While driving along the outside of it, we get absorbed into it through walls and left to fend for ourselves before ultimately coming into contact with a station wagon and a few people on the radio that managed to guide us safely to a garage, one of very few stable places in the zone. The catch is, however, the car that saved us is actually what is referred to as a remnant, which has bound itself to our character, which, over time, will cause us to become more and more obsessed with it before ultimately it kills you. Looking to avoid that fate and potentially leave this place, we can cooperate with the people on the radio who were actually scientists here before the big paranormal event happened to sort of sort both of those issues out. So over the course of the game, you'll kind of learn what this place was, what they were doing, how things got this way, and who these specific characters are. In broad strokes, though, I would say that the first few hours of Pacific Drive are very, very interesting story-wise, but it does fall off pretty hard in the mid to late game. I would say the story reaches a satisfying enough conclusion, but I do think it probably goes on a little bit longer than it really should have. And in my case, at least, when I finished the game, my initial thought was, ah, yeah, I don't really know what I expected, but that would pretty much sum it up, I suppose. <laughs> so it was just a little bit underwhelming, especially given how strong of a start we get off to. Next up though, let's talk about progression systems. What is actually happening over the course of this roguelite, where we'll be taking our car out on various drives across these paranormal areas. While we are doing that, we are going to be gathering resources, scanning anomalies, familiarizing ourselves with more, and then later on, once we get into the middle and deep zone, encountering more and more dangerous variations of these things. And all of that is going to allow us to spend those resources on unlocking blueprints 
via a computer back at our garage and upgrade our car with those blueprints in addition to our actual garage. Initially, the parts we have will essentially be junk, and we can upgrade and turn those into more impressive pieces of very specialized equipment if need be. And to that end, customizing your car becomes a pretty big part of the game, and in fact, one of the upgrades we'll be able to make is adding racks to our car that we can then mount things like extra battery power or fuel alongside other modifications that will give our car specific abilities to use, such as a damage-absorbing shield, a simple handbrake, or a jump system that allows you to get potentially over obstacles by jumping into the air, just to name a few. In addition to our car though, like I mentioned, we can upgrade the garage at the same time, and this is going to see you doing things like adding extra machinery that's going to be helpful, such as just places to store all your extra materials or car parts, alongside a cosmetic customization area where you can add like decals and flags and paint your car even. One of the upgrades even allows you to make items for yourself that make our character a little more resilient out in the zone when we are not in our car, which its supernatural nature normally protects us from things like radiation. But sometimes we have to get out of our car to gather resources, and that's where that upgrade system can come into play. And that's the gist of what the progression system has to offer. Now, I do also want to mention here that in the case things happen to go sideways for you, they do have a sort of built-in fallback system to make sure you never run out of resources entirely via the friendly dumpster at the garage. When you interact with this thing, it will spit out some supplies for you, and this is going to keep you from getting yourself in a situation where there's just no way forward. As things like car parts, etc. are more temporary than you might think, because while you can't upgrade all these parts, they will absolutely break on you, and if that happens out on a run, you might lose them permanently. Now, there is also a machine that will break down car parts or anything you put into it really that will just refund some of the resource cost so you'll often find yourself remaking car parts to get newer versions and especially given that a lot of these components have a sort of fatigue mechanic where once you've used them up to a certain point they get very fragile and might eventually break permanently and become less reliable or prone to individual little side effects. So that's another thing to keep in mind in terms of progression. A lot of this stuff is more temporary than you might think, in an effort to keep you constantly changing and experimenting with things. Now, one thing I didn't like about this progression system was mostly the resource costs associated with a lot of the late game stuff. Some of it is exorbitant, with you requiring hundreds of a specific resource to unlock something like just different clothing for your character to protect you from certain elements. And while you don't need to upgrade those things, given the problems that the game has with its story, like I mentioned, probably going on a little bit too long, these resource costs really don't help with that, and chasing that stuff down is where I was having the least amount of fun. But from there, let's talk gameplay, and as there is no combat, this is going to make up the bulk of the rest of the video. So, gameplay in Pacific Drive starts out at your garage, your hub area. From here, we're going to perform all our basic car maintenance, ideally before we head out, such as making sure our car has fuel, our batteries are charged, which is going to affect things like the headlights in a more simple version, but also typically your car-related abilities. And once you've got all of that sorted out, you'll then go to the big route map. This is where you are going to decide where you are headed next, but it of course requires us to drive along specific roads. At the end of these roads are junctions. These form the levels of the game. On longer runs, we'll be going to multiple junctions in a single go, and as the game progresses, certain junctions will be connected by highways, which make getting to individual places a little bit easier, as driving on a highway section of the road is a mostly safe passageway that poses very little threat, if any at all. Now, along these junctions is where we'll actually be playing the game and its core bit of gameplay, which is driving our station wagon, avoiding various anomalies, and trying to stay alive while we gather both anchors Anchor energy and resources. Anchor energy is something we need to fund basically all of our blueprints and unlocks, but also it's our ticket back to the garage, which we'll talk about more in just a second. Now, each of these junctions is a set area, but it has a bunch of different modifiers via all sorts of paranormal things that can spawn there, such as various anomalies you may or may not run into, and certain conditions that might happen, and this makes each run through a given area a little bit unique. For instance, this can just be simple stuff, like acid anomalies being particularly prevalent, the water in the zone corroding your vehicle, the area being more prone to causing punctures in your tires, for instance, 
just to name a few. Now, when our car inevitably either gets worn down from exposure to anomalies or just straight up bad driving, or you reach the end of this particular route as far as you can go because we need to scan things with our antenna back at the route map in order to figure out paths forward through the zone, which is constantly shifting, we will eventually need to head back to the garage. And this is going to be done by gathering up anchors. Anchors stabilize the zone and area. Now, most junctions will only allow you to be there for a certain amount of time before the storm starts moving in. Though some junctions do have a perpetually stable modifier that makes sure that never happens due to time. In addition to this though, once we have enough anchors to power up our arc device, which is what allows us to go out into the zone, we can use that arc device to pinpoint a gateway in our given junction that will allow us to transport ourselves back home. But upon activating this, the area goes into a storm mode where it starts creeping in and causing radiation. And you essentially have to race to the big beam of light in the sky to get transported back to the garage so you can start over and do this all again until you've beaten the game. So that's pretty much your general gameplay structure, but there are a few other things to know. For starters, while we will be doing a lot of driving, we are obviously not only driving, you can get out of the car, though you might want to remember to put it in park first, and leaving your car or headlights on will drain fuel in the battery, which you have to be mindful of. But we can go into buildings, scavenge them for all sorts of materials that we're going to need, and once you've played the game for a while, you'll start to learn what kind of resources come in what buildings. For instance, if you're looking for gas cylinders, you want science oriented buildings, but if you're looking for clothing, you mainly want to check dressers. Common sense stuff when you think about it, but the game does differentiate between all of that. Now, in addition to crafting things back at the garage, we will have a crafting station, albeit a basic one, in the back of our station wagon. We can use this to, on the fly, craft certain tools that we need to gather certain resources. For instance, you can get a pry bar that will get you into certain locked doors, an impact hammer which will break certain locks or certain resource nodes that have to be cracked open, and then your basic scrapper will turn things like TV or electronics into their baser parts to allow you to collect their raw materials. In addition to that resource gathering, however, we can also craft things that are allowing us to repair our car in some way. And while this can include just basic damage like repair putty will fix, there's also other problems that can crop up, such as your glass shattering, your tires going flat, etc., and that will require something like a sealant kit, or if you hit your headlights one too many times, they might have to have a bulb replacement, just to name a few examples. So taking care of both yourself and your car and preparing for that along any given drive is something you have to keep in mind. And while most of the time this is simpler than it sounds, especially once you get used to it, as this is a roguelite, sometimes you're going to be prone to some bad RNG. There was one particularly rough instance where I got a flat tire like four times in the span of about 30 seconds, which was obviously a really bad time. Now, what makes this unique and interesting is all of the modifiers and variations to anomalies, individual areas, and simply what part of the zone you're in. There are three parts to the zone, the outer, middle, and deep zone. Each of these has a different visual look. Basically, they get crazier the more you go in. But also, you'll encounter different anomalies in each area. And some of the more annoying ones, as you might imagine, are deeper in. And they will do things like hook onto your car and move you in ways you might not want to be moved, which can make navigating difficult. They might pull you into other anomalies such as acid pits, electric traps, tourists, which are mannequins that blow up just to name a few. And for about the first 10 or 20 hours, there's a lot of fun to be had navigating all of those various anomalies, upgrading your car, learning more about this stuff. But as I've mentioned, I do think it winds up overstaying its welcome just a little bit. As once you get to a point where you're doing about anywhere from five to seven junctions per run, where you don't even really need any materials unless you're grinding out the more expensive blueprints just to try to get to the end, there definitely came a point in the last few hours where I was like, all right, we just need to wrap this up. There is nothing else going on here. But before that, I was having a lot of fun. And then just a last few mentions before we move on. If you happen to die in 
a run, you'll just get sent back to the garage, but the catch is you'll likely have lost a bunch of stuff and your car will be hurt in some way, and depending on your difficulty modifiers, this will be more or less substantial, though you can go back to the junction where that happened and potentially get your stuff back on another run. So all is not lost, though you can keep yourself from losing anything if you want. Another thing to keep in mind is this game's save system. It is possible to quit out of the game now and save your current run, but the game will only save at the moment you enter a junction. As it is a roguelite, trying to avoid save scumming is something that is particularly important, especially as doing so would basically undercut the entire game, but they've added some options since launch that will effectively allow you to put the game down mid-run and then come back to that run without any penalties, for instance which was a nice change that makes the game feel a little better overall. Now let's start to wrap this up, talk about the Steam Deck before reaching our conclusion. So for the Steam Deck in this particular game, technically speaking, it is playable, it has cloud saves, it has controller support, but I find that the Steam Deck struggles with this one, which is more due to the lack of official support for it than it is the Steam Deck itself. Basically, by default, the graphical settings for Pacific Drive on the Steam Deck are going to give you a very terrible frame rate. And even if you adjust them and change them to the best of your ability, you're likely still going to struggle to hit 30 FPS even. And the developers have said that because they're a small studio, they don't really have the resources to spend on optimizing for the Steam Deck, which is what is causing a lot of the issues. So could you play Pacific Drive on the Steam Deck? Yes, if you wanted to play around with it a lot. And even if you do that, your FPS just still isn't going to be very good, which I do think is a bit of a shame because I think that platform would have been perfect for a game like this, but it is what it is. Moving on, though, let's talk positives and negatives before we wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side of things, I really loved the concept of this game. Both with its incredibly strong opening, the idea of all these paranormal happenings, and honestly just a driving roguelite was things I had not seen in this particular configuration before. And because of that, the game felt very unique. And given its heavily atmospheric vibe, a lot of that stuff comes together to make a very enjoyable experience, especially if you're into paranormal stuff. And it's definitely where the game shines. And because of that, the first 10 to 20 hours of that gameplay loop and how you're progressing things and learning a little bit about what went on here and the mystery of it is really fantastic stuff. But on the negative side, there are a few, I would say. Like I mentioned earlier, you can get some bad RNG in certain places where your car can just be hit with problem after problem in a very short span of time, and it can feel just very ridiculous at times. And while that's just kind of the nature of it as a roguelite, having to fix multiple tires going flat in the span of like a minute, or having to jump out and fix a headlight, or fix a wheel that's gone loose, just to name a few different things that can happen, gets old when it just repeatedly happens very quickly on a run. And given how crazy some of the deep zone areas get, some of that feels like it could have been paced out a little bit better. Especially when, towards the end of the game, the story starts to lose a bit of steam and the runs become a bit monotonous once you start running into mostly just the same stuff over and over again and you don't really need a ton of the materials you're driving by. Unless you feel like grinding out hundreds of items for very specific upgrades that you don't even need because you're at the end of the game anyway, which was weird especially since a lot of items only cost like one fabric to unlock the blueprint for. So it seems like there could have been some balancing there in terms of the resource costs of the blueprints you need for certain upgrades. And then there's the quirk system, which I actually forgot to mention in the gameplay portion, but here we are. There's a quirk system that allows your car to be hit with quirks that will cause it to operate in unexpected ways. Like say you open a door and this causes like the car to shift from park to drive or drive to park. Or if you turn on the headlights, maybe the trunk will open, that kind of thing. And you have to play this sort of guessing game at the garage to figure out what it is and then fix it. And there was not a single time that happened where that ever really added anything to the gameplay. Especially since, if you don't change the default difficulty option, you have a limited number of times per garage visit to guess what is wrong with your car so you can get rid of this thing. And some of those quirks make your car effectively undrivable. 
And stuff like that just wasn't fun for me, frankly. But that brings me to my conclusion. Pacific Drive is an interesting game with some unique concepts that I think definitely has the potential to be a lot of fun. But as you might have noticed in that negative section, I also think it is prone to a fair few issues. But the good news there is that it's a pretty cheap game. Full price, it's $30 on Steam, but it's been on sale a couple of times already. For instance, I bought it for $25 when it first came out on a launch discount. It's on 20% off right now for the next couple of days. And for that price, I can honestly say that I had a very good time for the money I spent. And because of that, I'd give it a buy with the caveat that this is, I would say, a somewhat niche game that obviously isn't going to appeal to everyone, so don't go into it expecting to get anything other than what it is. Though, do keep in mind some of those difficulty options can remove these problems entirely. For instance, if I didn't want the achievements for the 100%, I could have just turned car damage off and not dealt with some of the things I ran into. But at the end of the day, I had a fair bit of fun for the money that I spent on this one. And because of that, I think if it looks interesting to you, it is worth the buy. But that is pretty much going to do it for this particular video. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. Do let me know what you think of Pacific Drive down in the comment section below. Which of course means to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day. Thank you.